If you were to open up Super Smash Bros. Ultimate right now, there's a chance you might have a certain spirit on your spirit board. This is Luxley. He's from a DSiWare game called Luxley's Lineup. Try googling that. The results are sparse. Pretty much all that comes up is a four-part bare-bones video series from when YouTube looked like this. But I played it as a kid. So I can tell you that Luxley's lineup is a Nintendo published hidden picture game, but it's a little more than the usual hidden picture games you see on the app store. You know, the ones that are like titled like, ooh, look see, awesome see, hidden picture game, I see it, or, or like a, a tales in a box, hidden shapes in perspective. Oh wait, that's the UK title. Luxley's lineup is built different because instead of having you find objects in a painting, it has you physically rotating around a pop-up book. It's this nice little game full of detailed, cozy environments, and it's maybe one of the only games that actually earns its motion controls, and we're about to lose it forever. Uh, but hey, that's okay. Even if you're watching this after the eShop closes down, you can experience the game vicariously through a YouTube video. That's basically the same thing. So instead of retreading the same tracks that everyone else has tread about how Nintendo's history is getting more and more difficult to play, I propose that we just talk about Luxley's lineup. Take a peek into the fairy tale world, open up the cleverly detailed dioramas, and explore why this game spends most of its days living rent free in my brain. So we should probably start with the obvious, I didn't record this footage with a capture card. Instead, I opted for the classic 2008 point and shoot experience. And there's a reason for that. In order to really understand the perspective gimmick here, you kind of have to see in action. In order to detect tilting, usually games make use of an accelerometer, but the DSi doesn't have an accelerometer. So the developers at Goodfeel had to come up with something else. The game solves its position in 3D space by tracking your face. And it works about as well as face tracking did in 2010. In this specific case though, tracking your face works better than just using a tilt sensor because it means that you can move your head around to see different parts of the scene. But I definitely found that the most natural way to make it work was still to tilt the DS itself. It's not awful, but it's definitely not flawless. Honestly, if you calibrate it well and move slowly, the jank is mostly easy to filter out and you're left with a sometimes genuinely convincing 3D illusion. So if you see this happening, that's why. And don't get me wrong, the jank will receive its own appropriately sized section for getting ripped into later. I just don't want to front load that because I really do think this game has more charm than bite. Reviewers in 2010 made a huge deal about how the controls were a deal breaker or an immersion breaker or whatever, but if you can get past the jank, if you can suspend your disbelief for just a bit, Luxley's lineup contains one of the most interesting puzzle experiences in the whole DSiWare library. Luxley is a world famous author, and he has a bunch of ideas for his new book, but he's having trouble finding the words to put it together. So it's up to us to help him find him. There's a formation of wooden planks next to him that kind of looks like a toppled fence or something. And the bottom of the windowsill in the back looks the same as the toppled fence. So if we just line them up correctly, we find the letter E. And that's the hidden object operation that this game runs on. That's the lineup in Luxley's lineup. That's the moment you realize that this is no photo dojo. Finding a word is what unlocks that word for us to use in conversation with NPCs, which means that Luxley's lineup elegantly gets around the age old can't say no to the adventure problem. It's here that we're introduced to the world map, which of course is also a nice 3D diorama. These characters and levels are all inspired by various different fairy tales and folk legends. I think that Luxley might be the only original character made for the game. So off we go around the world collecting items and words and instead of the levels unlocking based on your star count or whatever collectible you might have in other games that have a world map, Luxley's lineup slowly opens up its world map when you find and use the right words. 
For example, this king is trying to hide his terrible secret, and you're told explicitly not to bring it up to him. So if you go up to him and point out his donkey ears after unlocking the words donkey and ears, he throws his guards onto you, dragging you through the castle gates and opening the next part of the map. It's a clever way to introduce a Pokemon power outage progress stopper into a game that doesn't have any power. Words are not the only thing we find in these levels though. Along with a word, each level has three to five objects to find and a handful of coins scattered about the environment. The objects are mostly characters and props from various different fairy tales, which kind of just means that the objects are just generally fantasy themed. Old ladies and fruits, grasshoppers and shoes, those sorts of things. As far as I can tell, the objects don't really do anything, aside from unlocking a minigame when you collect them all, but coins can be used to unlock hints. The game doesn't need hints that often, because once you realize that all the hidden words use the same font, you start seeing serifs everywhere. The geometric blocky font they chose hides well within the sharp geometric architecture, and it makes for a nice contrast to the organic cutouts of the regular objects. And since they're shown in the corner of the screen, you can usually look for the regular objects by their defining features. Like this mirror is perfectly round along the top, so we'll want to look for rounded stage elements. Sometimes though, one of the objects is just presented as a question mark, which means it's up to you to discover what the item even is. It makes for a fun challenge, trying to look around the environment for spots where elements clump up or for shapes that just kind of don't fit in. Having hints is a huge help for the wall you inevitably hit on some of the puzzles, and especially a huge help for when I'm trying to look good for a YouTube video. The perspective part is pretty lenient too. Even if what you've lined up is pretty off, the game will still just let you have it. It's kind of a testament to how quickly our brains identify shapes, because there were plenty of times that I thought I had the object formed perfectly, only to see the camera shift way more than I expected it to. There's a really wide variety of levels here, especially for a $5 game. And the simple pop-up book style seamlessly takes us from a royal ball to an undersea city. Honestly, I think the most interesting part of the game is the thoughtfulness that goes into designing these levels. I mean, obviously they have to look good at first glance. Each level has a clear theme and nice colors and a variety of scales of detail. Usually there's one large object and a smattering of smaller objects. But there's an important thing to remember. These levels aren't designed for your traditional 16x9 TV screen. These levels are designed for a sideways Nintendo DS. And the DS has a huge bar right in the middle of the screen. So most levels get sliced right down the middle. It seems like a limitation, but it actually guides the design into a really satisfying composition. Beanstalk on one side, house on the other. And from a gameplay perspective, it works really well too, because very rarely will an object be found directly in the seam. So it splits the world in two. Once you think you've looked everywhere on one side, you can start looking at the other. It really helps to kind of subconsciously keep the player from getting overwhelmed. Having the DS be sideways brings in another element. Holding your DS sideways feels kind of like holding a book, which just makes it feel that much more like a modernized fairy tale eye spy. But how do you figure out where and how to hide objects? Walter Wick, the eye spy photographer, says that he hides the objects just as he's assembling the rest of the scene, which is probably how some of these objects got hidden too. I can definitely imagine as the artists were putting a stage together based on its fairy tale, they got ideas for places that they could hide objects. But I think there's a little bit more planning involved because instead of just being a like little rubber band or a collection of thimbles or something, each object is comprised of a precise lining up of multiple stage elements. Plus, since each object has to be related to a fairy tale, they couldn't just turn any old apple into Aladdin. They'd have to find an apple that already kind of looked like Aladdin. Which would you look at that is open for bidding on eBay right now. And adding to the complexity, some of the levels work on a sort of cycle. Like here, the wind blows and moves a number of stage elements around, or here, this lady goes back and forth opening and closing the curtains. This not only fully completes the pop-up book vibe with back and forth style motion, but it also reveals and moves certain elements of the objects and words you find, which would probably need to be at least a little bit planned in advance. 
You know how in cartoons, one thing is less detailed than everything else and you can tell that they're gonna pick it up? This game has a similar problem where the objects that move are very clearly part of a hidden object. Like on returning to the first level after finishing the tutorial, there's this kid that knocks over a bucket onto some stairs and oh look, a wire. But in some maps, the movement is a stage wide change. Like in the wind level, everything moves, which helps to hide where exactly the object is you know it's going to be related to the wind, but you don't know exactly where. In the best case scenarios though, the movement is a red herring, or what seemed like just a little extra movement actually ends up being part of a puzzle. Like here, where what seems like an innocuous butterfly actually reveals and hides an apple in its wings. Ah, uh, their decision, their decision to use fairy tales just vibes so well with the pop-up book style. I know it's entirely just because you don't have to spend money to come up with or use public domain stories. It's definitely weird seeing a mention of The Little Mermaid without a Disney copyright disclosure. Which is a great reminder that Disney is a company who climbed to the top of the movie world on the backs of old stories and somehow managed to justify pulling the ladder up once they got to the top. But Luxley's lineup doesn't tumble into the pitfall that other fairy tale games seem to fall into, where the whole identity of the game is that it's comprised of classic stories. Most of the stories are just hinted at. And Luxley is just looking around for ideas. He's not particularly interested in retelling them. The fairy tales are there, but we don't have to hear about Goldilocks and her porridge troubles for the hundredth time if we don't want to. They could have easily themed the game around anything else, but I just don't think that the paper cutout aesthetic would work nearly as well with Metroid. The style just works so well. The focus on cutout shapes and generally getting rid of textures makes it a lot easier to see the hidden objects in unrelated areas. A number of times, the hidden object is not in some combination of shapes, but in the negative space that they leave. Keeping everything in this 2D cutout in 3D space style makes for a pretty easy turnaround time for the art department, but it also makes it so that a reasonably complex scene can even run on a DS with no problems. No need for real-time shadows and lighting, no need to render any pesky triangles, just pure, unadulterated fields of PNGs. It's got that crunchy, aliased DS era 3D look, but in a way that doesn't age it, it's definitely no Call of Duty. I don't really know which came first, the fairy tale theme egg or the pop-up book style chicken, but having them together makes for a nice little gem of an omelet with chicken and motion controls. There's really no way the game could work any other way, and when it works, the tilting action really does feel great, but often it doesn't work. Not only is there a good bit of frustrating jumpiness if you move too fast or if your lighting isn't perfect, but it goes a little deeper. The game needs a way for you to indicate that you think you see one of the hidden objects, and normally that's no problem, hit the A button or something. But while holding the DS like a book works well for the fairy tale theme, it doesn't make any of the physical buttons very easy to access at all. So the solution they settled on was to have an on-screen cursor that you control with the D-pad, which when you're holding the DS like a book is usually more than a thumb's reach away, leading to a really weird way of holding the DS with your hand sort of just along the bottom of the DS. And then, when you've got a hidden object lined up, you move the cursor over the object and then tap an on-screen button, which is slotted neatly into the bottom corner of the screen immediately above the D-pad. I ended up just tapping things on screen with my finger, which, if you remember, the DS didn't have capacitive touch like phones do nowadays. It had a more pressure-based touch screen, which means you really have to shift your hand to press the on-screen button with your fingernail to apply enough pressure for it to register. And shifting your hand shifts the DS a bit, which moves the perspective slightly out of line. It makes the secret hidden minigame unlocked for 100% completion a lot more difficult than I think it was designed to be. I did get used to it pretty quickly in my full playthrough, so it can be adapted to, but it's definitely top tier control jank. Does that make the game bad? No. Is Resident Evil a bad game for having tank controls? No. Am I saying that Luxley's lineup is as good as Resident Evil? Hey, why does the title screen sound like this?
Luxley's lineup is developed by Goodfield, who, before making this game, made a number of Japanese educational DS games about learning English for a generally child to teen audience. That probably explains a good bit about this game. The fairy tale theme, the focus on spelling English words, even the fact that the games held sideways might partially be because educational games on the DS inexplicably were all sideways format games. But this isn't the first non-educational game they made, because a couple years prior, Goodfield made Wario Land Shake It. And if you're not familiar with them, it won't be surprising to hear that after Luxley's lineup, they would go on to make Kirby's Epic Yarn, uh, and Yoshi's Woolly World, and Yoshi's Crafted World, and Kirby's Extra Epic Yarn, and Pucci and And at some point, they started getting bored with making games to be published by Nintendo, and started making Facebook social games and Android slot machine games, so it kind of makes sense too that they worked with Nintendo on making a couple of 3DS's later Street Pass games, which, if you blur your eyes, are largely indistinguishable from Facebook games. Recently, they've been getting into self-publishing full Switch games, but for a while, their focus was entirely on mobile games. These weird, short-lived, like, games-as-a-service slot machines and gacha games some of them are still available, in case any of you fall under the incredibly small Venn diagram of dog lovers and slot junkies. So it's not hard to imagine a world where Luxley's lineup was developed and released for phones. And if the core concept somehow managed to survive not being turned into a match three game, it just wouldn't function nearly the same. Sure, phones have accelerometers, but I think that the motion controls make a lot more sense tracking in relative to your eyeballs. And even if it did make use of the phone's camera, it would be impossible to account for the thousands of different phones, unique cameras, and, and, and viewing angles, and that's also why Luxley's lineup can't be emulated. Melon DS doesn't have camera support. At the time of writing, it barely has DSiWare support. It's completely hardware landlocked. Pretty soon, you won't be able to download it even if you have a DSi to play it. Even if you've previously purchased it. But maybe that's okay. I understand the disappointment in hearing that your childhood is getting shut down by a corporation. And there's lots of ways they could have handled the eShop shutdown better. Don't get me wrong. The erasure of games history in any way is a huge negative, no matter how you spin it. But what good is kicking at Nintendo's shins? They're not gonna turn back now. And even if they did, how long would it be until they just shut it down again? Maybe you're like me, and just the idea that there were experiences, however conceptual, that Nintendo was shutting down access to, kinda just got you feeling bad. Like a nostalgia-like gut feeling you're missing out on something big. You don't have nostalgia for your childhood just because they were good times. You have nostalgia for your childhood because there's no way you could go back there. Not in full, at least. You might be able to play the games you played when you were a kid or watch the shows you used to watch, but you'll never be able to unexperience the rest of your life. You might revisit those old games with rose-tinted glasses, either claiming them to be untouchable masterpieces that nothing new could ever even get close to, or maybe the game's just not as good as you remember. What was once a boundless world of possibilities suddenly collapses into a short, janky, simple game. But obviously, short, janky, and simple games can still be good games. A game doesn't have to be a masterpiece to be valuable. So why do we hold so much passion for these old games that we aren't ever going to be able to re-experience for the first time? And maybe I'm using we and you too much here, but I think even if you don't personally feel that way, you've seen that sentiment somewhere on the internet. And the closure of an old platform is, symbolically, the door to someone's long-held childhood memories being closed. The Nintendo eShop, fortunately, is not the only place to find games. And if you've spent any time devastated over the closure of an old games platform for whatever nebulous reason, I encourage you to just open the game store of your choice. 
scroll until you find a game that catches your eye. Whether it's the graphics, the description of the gameplay, it doesn't matter. If it's something that matters to you and you alone, that's reason enough. Don't look at the reviews. Don't worry about it being a worthwhile purchase or whatever. Just play the game. Let the experience wash over you and relish in the idea that you might be halfway through experiencing your next favorite thing for the first time ever. Even for its flaws and its failures, a 6 out of 10 game can still carry with it an experience you walk away from better for having experienced it. Every game is someone's favorite. Every game sits in the mind of someone as a masterpiece. Even bad games have value. It's up to you to find that value. The boundless joy you felt as a child might not be there anymore for you. You might have, over years of reading games criticism, become an expert in detecting and pointing out when games run afoul, but if you can get past the jig, if you can suspend your disbelief for just a bit, you might be able to find a little bit of that summer break feeling in whatever you put your mind to. And maybe one day, they'll find a way to make Luxley's lineup work even better than it did on the DSi. Oh, and uh, remaster the soundtracks too, because it's 100% bangers. In the meantime, I've done my games historian due diligence and uploaded a full commentary free HD playthrough of the game. The four part walkthrough might have me beat in time, but it doesn't beat me in video quality. It, listen, it was 2012, you can't blame anyone. Oh, actually, hey, Nintendo, remember how you made a VR headset? Like, Luxley's lineup would be perfect. You have no other choice than to track based on your eyeballs there. You already have all the art assets, I think, I hope. It would be a perfect first foray into like a real release out, you know, outside of the Labo and outside of the like, oh, we put Mario in VR. You're not fooling anyone with that. Hey, thanks for watching the video really appreciate you taking your time out of the day to watch a 20 minute video about some random old DSiWare game. There's a couple things that didn't quite make the cut in this video, so I've reworked them and put them over on Patreon if you want to watch those. I'm doing a little experimenting with the style. Um, let me know how you think about it uh, if you want me to do more of these. I might not. <laughs> uh, we're experimenting, we're trying some styles out, we're gonna see what sticks. So, but I think it's a good video nonetheless. I mean, I just made it, so I don't really know. I can't really tell. Uh, anyways, yeah, thanks. Bye-bye.